Well, hello again everybody. And this week we're going to be continuing our look at hot stuff with this quick 861DW hot air station. Now all of this equipment here is actually designed for soldering of surface mount devices in electronics, which is a subject that I've got very little experience in, but from time to time it is a job that I have to do. But as I said in part one of the video, the main reason that I have this equipment is that I got offered these three pieces of equipment as a job lot at a price that really I couldn't refuse. So I think it's probably fairer to say that this is just going to be an unboxing video and me having a first go at doing some hot air rework. Certainly I'm no expert. So I did buy this hot air rework station second hand so of course it's no surprise that the box has been opened previously but the chap that I bought it off said that really none of the equipment that he'd sold had really had much use. And I guess there is signs of that because uh, well, the original brochure and the, uh, the manual is still on top. I always like to have a quick flick through the manual. Let's just have a look at that. So it looks as though, well, I was going to say it looks like we've got a mixture of English and Chinese. Maybe we'll take a closer look at that later. And I think that's maybe some type of uh, packing sheet. So here's the unit itself. And... Uh, well, yeah, maybe it has been removed from the plastic bag, not exactly sure, but certainly can't see many signs of use. Let's see if we can just pop that out. We've got a power lead. Well, it looks like the power lead does actually enter the back of the equipment, so it's not on an IEC connector. Let's just lift this out. So I can see we've got a cable in here. I'm guessing that this is some form of grounding cable, maybe for ESD protection. Ooh, quite a heavy stand. Nozzles for SMD rework. Okay, so again, out the box, the unit appears to come with three straight nozzles. Now I'm sure that most of you will have seen hot air rework stations, even if you haven't used them yourself. So basically what we've got here is a hot air gun. So it blows out hot air out of the front of the nozzle here. And that hot air can be used to melt the solder on surface mount devices. So these, this equipment is really useful for removing surface mount devices from PCBs. And you can also use it to replace components as well. But they seem to get used more than anything for component removal. I mean they're good because you can blast the hot air at something like an IC and because it's quite a, a wide angle of hot air that comes out of here you can heat all the pins of the chip up at once and it makes it easier to remove. So the unit does come with a, a number of nozzles which I did show you earlier. Let's just take a look and, uh, at what we've got there. So the unit does come with three nozzles which I'm guessing just push onto the end. Well, yeah, they're actually quite a tight fit. Is that all the way on? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, they are a tight fit. Actually quite difficult to pull off. Now I did actually previously own a rework station, but on that one, when you change the nozzles, the nozzles actually came with a little nut and bolt assembly on them there. So you did actually have to take a screwdriver and undo them. And that could be um, you know, quite tricky when everything was, was hot. And also it was just a pain to have to get a screwdriver out. So the fact that you can actually install these nozzles without a tool does seem like uh, quite an advantage. Although these really are a tight fit. I mean, it's easy enough to put them on, but yeah, I am struggling just a little bit to uh, to take them off again. Maybe they loosen up slightly with use. I wonder what size these nozzles are. So I think the largest one it comes with is about maybe 7.5mm. Middle size one is about 5mm. And the very small one, the long reach one, is just over 4mm. Now of course you can actually also use it without a nozzle. Um, these are actually used just to direct the heat in a, in a much smaller area. So if you've got lots of components all tightly packed, you don't want to necessarily heat everything up on the board. You want to direct the heat in a certain area. You would fit one of the smaller nozzles. If you want to direct the heat more widely over a bigger area, you use a bigger nozzle. I'm guessing generally you probably use the biggest nozzle you can get away with, much like soldering iron tips. 
So just taking a look into the end of the nozzle here I can actually see some white material which I think is like a ceramic former and then wrapped around that ceramic former we've got some resistance wire so it's what you would consider like a fairly traditional heating element maybe a little bit like you would find in something like a hairdryer uh, not dissimilar just a lot smaller but unlike a cheap hairdryer that relies on the volume of air flowing over the heating element to actually decide the temperature of the hot air coming out of it this is actually temperature controlled so we will have some form of thermocoupling here so what it's doing is it's constantly monitoring the temperature of the hot air coming out of the nozzle and uh, it's controlling the amount of energy which is flowing into the heater thus maintaining a much more accurate temperature well certainly that's the idea anyway we'll have to try that you can see that the handpiece here it's actually connected back to the main unit using this quite thick tube just feeling this tube it's got that slightly kind of sticky feel that silicon tubing has so I'm fairly sure that this is a heat resistance tube and uh, I'm guessing it's about a meter long so yeah you've got a good working radius away from the main unit and you can probably see that the tube itself it is relatively thick unlike for example a cable going to the handpiece on a soldering iron well the reason that it's so thick is because there's quite a few things going on within this tube now we said that this produces lots of hot air well the actual hot air we've got a heating element here but the actual fan or the little compressor unit that produces the hot air that's actually installed in the main unit so you've got a tube a little pipe running down here which blows cold air so the unit blows cold air down a tube and then it comes into the handpiece it gets heated in the heating element and then it gets changed from cold air into hot air and squirts out the end so we've got this tube carrying the uh, the air pressure to actually make the device work we've also got the actual power to this heating element which I'm guessing is probably 230 volts but I'm, I'm not actually sure and we're also going to have some wiring from the thermocouple which is installed in the heating element and uh, again that's got to run back to the control board in the main unit so that's the reason why this actual pipe is relatively thick because it's got quite a few things going on inside there so installed inside the main unit what we've got is effectively I think they use a centrifugal type air pump and that, that's where the actual source of the blowing air that's where the air compressor is located and I can see that at each end of our tube here we've got these spring strain reliefs now I'm guessing that it's important that we don't put too much too tight a bend radius on this tube in because we would probably end up cutting off the airflow to it so yeah so they're giving us these quite substantial springs here just to soften up that bend radius and they seem to work very well Taking a look at the front of the unit here I can see that we've still got the LCD protector installed so let's go ahead and remove that. I'm just going to take a moment. And I'm guessing the function of these controls is really going to be quite self-explanatory so starting on the left hand side we've got an up push button and a down push button and it's got the legend temperature next to it so this is actually going to regulate the temperature of the hot air that comes out of our nozzle likewise on the other side of the equipment we've got one that's labeled air so we can actually press the up button or the down button and that's actually going to regulate the quantity of air that's coming out of the uh, nozzle so we put it up you're going to get more air coming out it's going to be blowing harder if we put it down it's going to be blowing less hard this air control is useful because if you've got the air speed set too high you can have a habit of just blowing all the components off the board as soon as you unsolder them or when you're trying to resolder them so sometimes you need maybe a lot of airflow if you're trying to unsolder something but when you actually want to resolder something you actually want a lower airflow so you find that people who use this equipment they are constantly adjusting both the airflow and the temperature to suit the conditions of the PC board and the size of the components which they are removing or replacing we've also got a power switch on the front here which i'm actually glad to say is a proper clicky clacky main switch and none of that soft start nonsense and then here we've got three push buttons that say channel one channel two channel three now i understand what these are for is we can actually program the unit to preset the airflow and the temperature 
for various types of jobs. So if you've got a favourite setup that consists maybe of an air temperature of 270 and an airflow of 50%, what you could do of that, you could have that as channel one, maybe for removing some components, you want a higher temperature, maybe 400 degrees, you could set that to channel two. I don't know, maybe you want to do some heat shrink requiring a lower temperature, maybe you could set that to channel three. But basically you could actually just preset the unit here using these quick buttons. On the rear panel there's not very much going on. I can see that we've got the manufacturer's label here and it's saying that the operating voltage for this is 220 volts VAC and the output or the power consumption is 1000 watts. We've also got the manufacturer's name and the model number so this is manufactured by Quick and it's the model 861DW. We can see that the electrical main supply enters the unit on the right here. Interesting enough it has been hardwired rather than using something like an IEC connector. I've got to admit I've got enough IEC connectors rolling around my bench. I'm not sure why they've done that. Perhaps it's because it is a higher current device being 10 amps. Not sure. And to the left of the mains input for all you equipotential earth bonding fanboys which can be used for electrostatic discharge protection when connecting things like ESD wrist straps or when connecting ESD safe table surfaces. Well I've never really understood the idea behind these little plump pin condoms but we don't need that so let's remove it. Let's go ahead and get this thing plugged in. Now I would be interested to see if this unit does live up to its 1000 watt rating so we'll plug it in via this energy monitoring device. The sockets on my workbench are actually protected with a fairly low current fuse. I think it's around 5 amps so I'm a little bit concerned that when we actually switch this on with its 1000 watt power consumption it may take out the fuse. I guess we're going to find out now so let's switch on. Oh we've got light. Now with the handpiece installed in the cradle here, the heating element and the compressor fan, it's not actually switched on at the moment so I can see that it's only drawing about 0 0.01 of an amp but I think what will happen is when I actually take the handpiece out from the cradle the unit should automatically switch on I believe so let's find out. Okay and it did that so it looks as though, wow did you just see that you probably didn't. This shot up to 100 degrees almost instantly. Now in the past I've used a much lower powered hot air station so it was actually amazing at how quickly that reached 100 degrees. It was pretty much instant and yeah we have got some hot air coming out of here so that's what we'd expect. Let's put it back in its cradle and see if it switches off. Yep yeah, it certainly did that. Let me try that again. little bit of overshoot there but as you just saw it actually comes up to 100 degrees pretty much instantly. So in theory now we should be able to just increase the temperature so let me do that. So we can increment it gradually. I wonder if it will go faster if we hold the button down. Okay there we go. So I think probably a default temperature is probably around 270 degrees so let me do that. And let's see what that looks like in terms of current. So can you see that the current did shot up there as it tried to pump energy into the heating element. So the heat up is really quite rapid but once it has heated up it actually just maintains the temperature. So I think the peak there was just over 5 amps and now it's just regulating at well about 2.5, 2.7 amps. Let's just increase the temperature still further. Okay so I'm at 400 degrees now and it's drawing 4 amps. Let's put it back into its cradle and what we should see it's going to ramp the temperature down and the power is going to turn down as well. Okay so we can see that we're only drawing about 0.6 of an amp now I've put the unit back in the cradle so it's just blowing air but it's switched the heating elements off. And now in terms of power okay so it did actually pull just over a thousand watts there it's heated up almost instantly and now it's actually just maintaining the temperature of the airflow at about 500 watts.
I think it really is quite impressive. As soon as we put the handpiece back into its cradle, you can see it obviously detects that. It turns the heating element off, but it actually turns the airflow on to full. Because what it's trying to do, it's trying to cool the heating element down as quickly as possible. And I guess to make everything a little bit safer. But I think that that uh, cool down mechanism is really quite impressive. So the cradle for our handpiece here, it really is quite heavy weight. I think it's probably made from something like aluminum, but just picking it up, I can see that there's what I think is a piece of steel which is fixed to the bottom. So it is very positively weighted, so it's not very easy to turn over. Very well balanced. And you can see that also that the actual handpiece here, it's got a collar around it, which I'm guessing does two things. It helps just to keep your fingers away from the heating element, which is, of course, is going to be blisteringly hot. But I can see that this collar also just locates on this inner ring. So it's actually quite easy to put the, uh, to put the handpiece into the holder. You don't have to be particularly gentle with it. It finds its way into the holster really quite easily. But I do think it's really clever the way that the temperature and the power all ramps down when you actually put it back into the cradle. So I'm guessing that there must be some kind of detection here in the hand piece. So just taking this magnetic compass, you can see that as I move it around the top of the cradle here, the needle actually swings round. So what we've got here is quite a powerful magnet that must be installed here. And when we actually put the hand piece back into the cradle, I'm guessing there must be a reed switch or maybe a Hall effect transistor. So it's obviously detecting that magnetic field when it goes back into the holster and it uses that to uh, to power the unit down really very clever and I've also just noticed at the bottom of the cradle we've got this u-shaped piece of metal so I'm guessing what this is for is probably to remove these nozzles when they're hot so let's give that a try can we do it actually yeah that works really quite well not only can we modify the temperature of the hot air coming out of the nozzle, we can actually also change the amount of air flow. So I'm guessing if we actually click up and down it will do that. Let's see what the minimum air flow that we can set is. Okay, so we can actually set one. I'm just going to put my hand in front of the nozzle. Okay, yeah, it is actually still outputting hot air, and it's but it's barely running. I wonder what the maximum is. Well, that's actually set to 120 now. It's absolutely blowing a gale. But the interesting thing is, even at full airspeed, it can still precisely maintain the temperature of the hot air. I think that's quite impressive and something that I would just like to check. Now, I'm guessing that at 120, that feels like an awful lot of air exit in the nozzle, so I think we'd turn that down. I think 50% feels a little bit more like what the normal setting would be. Okay, so we've got the airflow set to 270. It's actually showing slightly higher temperature, so we're showing 280 degrees at the moment. For a set temperature of 270, I would still say that that looks pretty close. Let's, list, let's just increase the airflow now. So now with our airflow set to a maximum of 120, a temperature of 270, you can actually see that the temperature of the nozzle here is 269 degrees, so it's maintaining the air temperature even when it's on full power. I think that's really very, very impressive kind of temperature control, really precise, impressive. Now while we've got the thermocouple out, let's just set it to the maximum temperature, which appears to be 500. Can we get 500 out of it? So it does appear the maximum temperature that I can set is around 260 degrees, but that could actually be a limitation of this thermocouple probe, I'm not sure. Let's set a high temperature now, maybe 450. I think I'll leave the airflow the same, so let's press down channel 3. And I think it's stored that. And now let's try a much lower temperature, maybe something for heat shrink. Let's try maybe 250. Let's press channel 1 to store that. So now I should be able to quick select any one of three different temperatures. So we're at 250 now, let's select 350. And the unit ramps up almost instantly and now let's select 450. 
slight overshoot and then back down and 250 you can see the unit's cooling down now it might take a little while to get back to 250 let's see okay 250 degrees that really is impressive so I've had a look in the junk pile and as you can see I've found an old circuit board here which has got quite a few surface mount components including two or three quite large quad flat packs. I think this board probably comes out of something like a telephone but I'm not exactly sure. But what I thought we could do is let's have a go with the hot air station try to remove some of these components. So at the moment I've got the temperature set to 420 degrees and I've got our airflow set to about 60. Now I've got no idea what the correct setting should be. I think with anything like soldering and hot air stations it just takes some practice before you find out what's going to work for you. Okay so I've been going for about 20 seconds. I think I can see that the solder's now molten. Can I pick it off? Okay, easy as that. Let's try that again. I've just increased the airflow from 60 to 70. Wow, that really is so simple. Now of course one of the huge advantages of using a hot air station like this is that we're not putting heat on individual pins. We're actually heating up quite a large area of the board. Let's try and remove something a little bit smaller. Well that is almost instant. Just having a bit of a fail picking the component up there. So just the feel of this quick hot air station over the previous version that I had certainly I can just tell that we're actually dumping an awful lot more heat into the board. These components come off instantly and effortlessly. I really couldn't recommend this highly enough. I can see we've got a big pile of surface mount resistors here. I wonder if we can just literally just sweep them out of the way. Yeah, which we can. Absolutely effortless at removing components. I wonder if we can remove these surface mount electrolytic caps or if they'll just explode. I guess it's time to find out. <laughs> yeah, we certainly don't seem to have any problem with those fellas, do we? Well, all I can say is it's just really too easy. Now I'm sure that's only taken a couple of minutes, but you can actually see we've actually removed a huge number of components here, all easily removed from the board. And from what I can see, we've actually also got absolutely no damage at all to the circuit board. I'm impressed. Well, as you can see, I've gone ahead and I've got out the microscope because I thought we could have a go at removing some of the smaller components. But before I do that, let's have another go at removing a capacitor. Now one thing I am immediately struggling with slightly using the microscope is that I'm having to use the actual nozzle here. It's a kind of an angle of a 45 degrees and that's actually quite tricky to do. Okay, I think I've got it. Oh, ah, <laughs> okay, so I think I put too much heat into that one because the capacitor just exploded. <laughs> Oops. What I was trying to say before that capacitor exploded is that I'm having problems getting the heat onto the board because the handpiece is just so tall it won't really fit under the microscope as you can probably see. Now you can actually buy nozzles for these that have got kind of a 45 degree angle so then I could actually come in more or less horizontal to the board rather than trying to angle the handpiece vertically down like that which does seem to be a, a bit of a problem for me. Let's try and remove another IC package. Ha <laughs> ha. 
and here's a transistor or a regulator, not sure what it is. Oh, so I think I saw the solder go molten there, can we get that off now? Now so far all the components that I've removed have been leaded components, they've got little legs on them. So of course we could have just used various techniques using a soldering iron to actually remove those components. But we've got another IC on here which I'm guessing could be something like a ball grid array. Now it doesn't actually have any exposed legs on it and because we haven't got any legs to put a soldering iron tip onto there's actually no way of removing this without perhaps using either hot air or some kind of an oven or maybe a hot plate as you saw me use in last week's video but I think we can have a go at removing this using the hot air station so let's try that. As you can probably see this is a relatively large IC so what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've just removed the actual tip or the nozzle off the handpiece because I'm just going to use the bare end of it because I think we're going to do better at getting more heat onto it so let's have a go with that. Well, as you can see, I did manage to remove our ball grid array without too much trouble. It was actually a little bit more difficult than I expected it to be. I think what the problem is, is actually there's so many little pads here. And this is quite a small board. I think when I was trying to remove the chip, there was actually so much surface tension and stiction between the solder on the chip here and actually the PCB itself. It was actually just dragging it around. So I think probably what happened is I ended up putting far too much heat into this board because I just wasn't overcoming this stiction. So I've gone ahead and I've just increased the airflow a little bit now and I've also increased the temperature to 430. All trial and error with these things I'm sure you just have to learn what temperatures and what air settings work for what components. It's all going to depend on the size of the component and things like the ground plane design on your circuit board and just how much thermal mass you've got under here. Well up until now we've been using our hot air station to actually remove components but it is actually quite possible to use a hot air station to put them back on again although I've got to admit it's not something that I've ever done before so we're going to be trying this for the first time. I think if I was trying to reinstall a package like this the way that I would actually do it I'd actually just use a soldering iron using the technique where we actually just tack down cross corners and then we just drag solder across it. I think that's the way I would do it but given that this video is about hot air rework stations. I'm going to have a go for the first time using hot air. So let's just consider this part of the video as a little bit of an experiment because I'm really not sure the best way to do this. Now the way that I've seen other people do it is I'm not sure what this board is but it's probably got unleaded solder. As we know unleaded solder just makes everything more difficult so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a normal soldering iron. I'm just going to get rid of all that old solder, uh, all that old unleaded solder and we're going to actually replace it with some leaded so I'm just going to do that now. So to do that I'm just going to get a big ball of solder I'm just going to wash it over effectively dilute the old unleaded stuff. And now just taking a piece of solder wick I'm just going to have a mop round with that. And using some leaded solder just going to retin all of those pads. So let's take our IC now and put it back on. I can see where pin 1 is there but I think it'll just annoy people more. Let's actually make a point of putting it the wrong way around. I'm actually going to tell you I'm going to do it so I can deprive you of leaving it in the comments. So there we go, we'll put it the wrong way around. So I believe the technique at this stage is really not to care too much that it's everything's actually off centre and it's not really correctly seated. So we're just going to put some heat into it and try and melt the solder.
Well, there we go. Eventually it did manage to centre itself, but I did find that more difficult than I expected. And just to finish off with today, I'm going to have a go at replacing another of the ICs, but I'm going to use some solder paste. Now, last time I actually used this solder paste, I'm afraid I really didn't have a lot of luck with it. Actually, it looks like I put far too much on here. This nozzle is really difficult to, uh, to get an even flow out of. Let me try again. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the best I can do. I'm obviously not very good at laying down solder paste. Anyway, let's go and find an IC to drop down. Well, in theory, what should happen now is when we actually put some hot air onto this IC, it should actually melt the solder paste and the surface tension should actually pull the component, it should actually pull the component onto the pads. Now I've actually turned the airflow down a little bit on our hot air station because I didn't want to actually blow the IC away. Well that solder paste is really thinning out and going everywhere isn't it? I must have far too much on there, this is probably just going to end up as a mess isn't it? Okay, well that does actually appear to have worked, doesn't it? But as you can see, the IC has actually managed to seat itself and centre itself on the pads really quite nicely. That was actually fairly easy to do and it was probably quicker and maybe easier uh, than actually doing drag soldering. It's just a shame that I uh, made such a mess of putting the solder paste down. I guess like all these things, a bit more practice is required, isn't it? However, when it comes to using the hot air station itself, I actually think, again, it works brilliantly. Absolutely no problem whatsoever there. You can see on the bench I've got my old RU852 and the Quick 861DW. Now it might have been useful to do a comparison between the two units, but to be quite honest they really don't compare. The Quick unit is so far ahead of my old rework station, it's, yeah, they're just worlds apart. Now in terms of price, the 861 here in the UK, it retails at just over, I think it's about £215. You can actually buy on Amazon, but you're probably better going to a specific solder equipment supplier, so I suggest you give Kaiser Tech a ring. This one is available from various places on eBay, and the price of this is about £100. Now, they both actually do the same job, and I actually used the 852 for many years. It worked, it worked fairly well, it did everything that I asked of it. Now, if you're wondering what the difference is, I think one of the main differences is it's the way that the Quick just delivers the heat. It heats up instantly, and the temperature regulation just seems to be amazingly good, regardless of what airflow you've got going through it. Whereas, yeah, the, um, the actual setting here certainly takes a lot more trial and error. And we haven't also got the volume of air coming out of this unit. Now this is also 600 watts, so it's, you know, it's 400 watts less than the quick unit here. Now you really do notice that, especially when it comes to actually the, uh, the handpiece here heating up. When you actually increase the temperature, it seems to crawl up to temperature and then overshoots and undershoots quite badly. Again, the temperature control on the Quick is just amazingly good. Well, for those of you that have watched my previous videos, you'll know that when it comes to handing out the points at the end of the day, I really can be quite a hard taskmaster. But in the case of our Quick 861DW, I am really struggling to actually retract marks. I think this might be the first piece of equipment that I've ever given a 10 out of 10, because that's what I'm going to give it. I actually think that it's really well built. I think it's very good value for money, and I actually think it also works exceptionally well. Now, as I said at the start of the video, when it comes to using hot air stations like this, or in fact doing surface mount work in general, I actually do very little of it myself and have very little expertise in it. So what I suggest you do is, there is an awful lot of reviews for this online, but what I suggest you do is go and watch some reviews by people who use this equipment professionally. People who use them all the time, like Lewis Rossman, because he actually also gives this piece of equipment a good review. 
I can't fault it. I think the only other thing I would say about this unit is that it's definitely worth maybe going to buy some of these tips that are bent over at 45 degrees because it can be a little bit difficult in some situations to actually hold the handpiece vertically, especially if you're trying to use it with some form of microscope as I was using. So definitely it would be worth investing in some of those 45 degree tips. But I think for today that'll do. So until next time, bye bye for now. Okay, I think I've got it. Oh, ah. <laughs> okay, so I think I put too much heat into that one because the capacitor just exploded. Oops. <laughs>